afternoon. We are at one o'clock straight up, so we've got a few things to uh, take care of before we get to Aileen's uh, keynote. So we are going to uh, first uh, announce the winner of the Stranahan's uh, whiskey yeah. bottle. PLSC. PLSC. Uh, the winner is Callie Weber. Colorado. Yes. Colorado Springs Utilities. Yes. Congrats. All right. Next, we're going to invite Eltron up here. Uh, he's our GIS and the Rockies board president, and he's going to present a couple of scholarships. Uh, this is the first year GIS and the Rockies has been able to give scholarships, and uh, we're going to have him uh, award those at this time. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, I guess I didn't win the whiskey, so <laughs> a little bummed out, but that's, that's fine. Um, I trust that everyone had a good time at the conference this year. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to extend um, my heartfelt um, wishes to the planning committee. I think they did an exceptional job this year putting our conference together. Um, the GIS and Rockies, um, conference has had a strong history of bringing geospatial professionals together um, in an environment where that fosters learning, um, encourages collaborative and innovative ideas. And this, our 30th annual um, conference, I am pleased to present our very first GIS and Rockies award. And this award goes to two special individuals, um, first being Shannon Kelly. I'd like to invite her to come up. Shannon, Shannon is a PhD student at the University of Denver, and she'll be our first recipient. Okay, so our second recipient would be Madeline Kelly. And she's also from the University of Denver, a graduate student. Okay. Thank you, guys. So before we end this, this segment in the program, before Carrie leaves, I would definitely like to thank um, three persons who, um, I want to call them the pioneers in this scholarship award, um, Dave Watson. Dave, please stand. All right. Mike, Mike Johnson, who's also on the board, he couldn't be present today, but also a pioneer. And Kelly, um, Kerry, sorry. I just want to thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys for the hard work. Okay, enjoy the rest of the conference. Right. Thanks, Eltron. Uh, today we have Dr. Aileen Buckley with us. She is from Esri, and she's going to share with us her 25 years of experience in mapping, and uh, we're so lucky to have her. And uh, I'm going to try to give her all the time she needs. And so. Without further ado, let's all welcome Aileen Buckley to the stage. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I've been making maps for a long time. Kind of makes me feel old, but I love it, so that's okay. Uh, what I want to talk about today are some actual pr basic principles of cartography, and I'd like to demonstrate some of those through some of the work that I've done in the past few years. Um, so let me start out by saying that the goal is to try and make maps that people are willing to look at so that they can become engaged with the map because they want to learn something so that's the informing part. 
and then it may even prompt them to take action. So that's the inspire. So that's where the title of my presentation came from, making maps that in engage, inform, and inspire. And if you really think about it, um, it has to sort of be in that sequence anyway, because if you don't get your audience engaged with your map, then they're not going to learn anything from it anyway. And if they don't learn something from it, then they're probably not going to be prompted to action. So that's where the title came from. And um, a colleague of mine, Stuart Allen, who is a premier cartographer, I think one of the best in the world, um, he worked on the Atlas of Oregon with us. He likes to say it this way, we're making maps, we're not dumping data onto a page or onto a screen. So we're talking about maps, not da data dumps. And I want to talk about this little uh, set of um, data here for just a minute, because it was used, that in information that's now in digital format was used to create this map. And this map shows the distribution of the slave population in the southern states. Um, while Lincoln was in office. President Lincoln was in office. So the darker areas have a higher um, slavery rate. Um, the proportion of the population that's enslaved is higher in those areas. Um, you can see that in, along the Mississippi River, there are really high values in here. Even up over 90% of the population was enslaved in those areas. And the lower um, areas either had lots of um, you know, freed slaves, or they might have been in areas where there weren't any plantations, up in the mountain areas of Appalachia. So this was a um, pretty influential map uh, for President Lincoln. It was written that he referred to this map often, using it to understand how the progress of emancipation might affect Union troops on the ground. And it even appears in this um, painting by Francis Bricknell Carpenter called The First Reading of the Emancipation Proclamation of President Lincoln. And if you look down in the right-hand corner, you will see that map. So maps really do have the power to inform and inspire um, action. So how can we take advantage of that opportunity? What can we do to make our maps do that as well? Before I get into some of the tips and tricks that I've used over the years, some of them a little bit more flamboyant, some very subtle, I just want to talk a little bit about the way that we think about information. So let's just do a little review on how the visual percept perceptual system works. So you see something, that image is transferred to your brain. I'm not going to go into all the it's upside down, blah de blah But then your brain processes the information. It's the same thing with the map. You look at the map, the brain gets the information, and then it processes that. So the first thing that we have to be able to do is see what's on the map. And if we say that seeing is being able to, we have to have the ability to see it, we also have to have the ability to recognize what that is. If we see a red dot on the map, we need to understand what that is. What does it represent? So, but primarily, before we try and figure out what it means, we have to be able to see it. So that's what we call legibility. The ability to be seen and the ability to be recognized or understood. So if I look at this image, if I see this feature in the landscape, then I can say to myself, oh, yeah, well, that's the Denver, Denver State Capitol. That is the Denver State Capitol, isn't it? <laughs> and I was looking for some drawings um, that captured it as it is now, so I double-checked that the wrapping is still up there on the, the dome, and it, it was in the two satellite images I saw, so. <laughs> okay, so legibility depends on two things. It depends on size and it depends on contrast. And size is a function of distance. So when I'm talking about size of features on a map, I'm talking primarily about symbols, because the features in reality are represented by symbols. 
They could be point symbols, they could be line symbols. If a line is too thin, it might not be able to be seen. If a polygon is too small, it might not be able to be seen. Um, and also text, very important thing about text. And um, I'm just gonna make a plea right now for anybody who's working on web mapping to remember the people like me who have old eyes because I'm finding it harder and harder to find the tiny, read the tiny bits of text on maps. Remember who your audience is, if they're an older audience, or even like just, let's say older than their 30s. Let's just to be safe, okay? Put, put larger text, that's my little plea. All right, um, the, the other thing it has to do with uh, viewing is that there's a field of view. And again, it's a function of distance. So when the field of view and the image in the field of view is closer to you, then things can be shown differently than when things are farther away. So if I'm looking at a computer screen here, or if I'm looking at a piece of paper, which would generally be about the same distance from me as my computer screen right now, then the way I'm designing for that is different than the way I'm designing for something that's quite a far distance away, like a poster or a wall map. Um, and also PowerPoint presentations. I'm gonna confess to you right now that I did not alter my maps to be visualized, um, uh, what's the word, optimally on the PowerPoint slides. I took them from the way I was designing them for the screen or for print. So you're just gonna have to keep that in mind when you see them. It actually is quite a big task to change your maps even a little bit so that they are optimized for a different format. So that is a part of my presentation that you'll be seeing maps that were designed for a different presentation format. Okay, the other part of legibility is contrast. If it's too dark, even if something's big enough, you won't be able to see it. Think about it. If you're in the dark and somebody's standing there, you won't even see them if it's too dark. So they could be a Yeti, but you wouldn't see them if it's too dark. Also, if it's too light, then it can also be a little blinding and it'll be hard to see. Same thing with maps, maps that are too dark, maps that are too light. The interesting thing about the, pro I changed the projectors in the room I was in this morning, is that they almost always wash things out and I didn't change the contrast on these, so I'm sorry. I should have changed the contrast on the projectors. But we know something about visual contrast. We've done studies, this is in uh, the textbook that we completed last year, it's called Map Use, Reading Analysis Interpretation. It's in the eighth edition now. Um, we did uh, create, uh, we did some calculations and we created this graph that shows you what are some pretty good combinations of foreground, background, lines and symbols, text, et cetera. So you can see, obviously, brown on bl black on brown has a really low value. But surprisingly, um, red on yellow isn't too bad. Oh, black on white is one of the high is, is the highest one, obviously. So there are guidelines to help us figure out how these things can look better. Um, the other thing about being recognized is, uh, or being able to understand what's on a map, is that it needs to be recognized, as I mentioned earlier. So. We look at something, we sort of process it a little bit, and then we have to s figure out what that thing is. So I see it, I'm processing it, and then I'm trying to fit it into really my worldview, or what we call our mental map. Because if it can't fit into your mental map, then you can't make decisions based off of it. So problem is that we can see something really quickly. We can process it fairly quickly, but cogitating over it, or actually there is actually a, a, there is a verb called cognitioning it. This kind of sounded weird to me. So I'm just going to say putting it into your cognitive you know, bank and letting it play out, that's going to take you know, sometimes even more than 20 seconds. This is a trick because we're already working with low attention spans, short attention spans, especially when we get to web mapping. So 
in addition to needing to see things at a good size with good contrast, being able to understand what those things are, we already have just perceptual challenges. Sometimes the content on a map can be too much. It's cluttery and people are overstimulated by it and they have a hard time deciphering content that you want them to be deciphering. Sometimes it's hard for them to find the important thing on the map. Or sometimes they get stuck on unimportant details and they never get to the important thing. So there wasn't any filtering involved or there was just too much put, put on to begin with. So let's just do a couple little tests. Did it take you like less than a second to find the red circle? Yeah, color is a really great indicator for us. We, we generally work really well with color. I have to tell you a quick story, which is that one of the best cartographers I know, um, I saw him on you, a YouTube video recently because he got a pair of those glasses that correct for color blindness. Have you seen these? Yeah, so he, I didn't even know he was colorblind. He's just an awesome design cartographer and another guy that I work with is as well. So how they're compensating for color blindness to begin with, I'm not sure, but there are, there, they have these glasses now that are taking care of color blindness. You can imagine in the future, we're not gonna have to worry about correcting for color blindness. You might have your computer screen set up to already correct for you, or you might have a pair of glasses, or even in the far future, may, you may even get like a cataract surgery and have a lens implanted that takes care of your color blindness for you. So color is really important for cartography, and I'm gonna make a confession. Very rarely do I try to uh, design for color blindness because I think people can have learned how to compensate. But let's see what happens if we're not using color and using something else instead. Now find the red circle. Well, it doesn't take that long. It's right here. But a little longer, wouldn't you say? Probably. Okay, now what happens? Find the red circle a little bit longer. Okay, so the first two examples are something that we call pre-attentive processing. We really can capture the information quickly, we get it. Takes a little longer, a little bit more focused attention when content gets a little bit more complicated. And then we can really push the limits on our map users if we don't provide them some real clues to help them work through the um, Pat, to find the patterns on the map. Again, that can take time, so um, we need to allow our map users time to read those maps. Now, I mentioned before that this is the way that we process information off maps is that we ultimately fit it into our mental map. We try to figure out what it is that we have learned about and then we put it into something we know. Sometimes it's a, a tighter space geographic space on our, our mental map, and sometimes it's a bigger geographic space. So some of you know exactly where that Denver Capitol building is, Denver State Capitol building is, and you can immediately see its location in the world. For me, I'm not familiar with it the way you are, so I place it in Denver, or probably towards the center of the city, right? That's about as far as I can go with my mental map. So we're constantly doing this with information we receive around the world, or, you know, from the world around us, and also the information that we get off maps. And sometimes we have a very sort of juvenile or underdeveloped mental map about things. You know, I can only get to something if I go back exactly the way I came. And I will confess to you that the other night I went out to find some bottled water and I had to go to a Safeway and they had construction down here on Day Creek Road. Yeah, Day Creek Drive, and I went up onto the highway, and then my phone died, so I had no way to route back except to go exactly back the way I came. But that's because I'm, you know, this is a nascent area for me to understand. It's not unusual that we all engage in this kind of activity at some point. And then sometimes our mental map is really kind of skewed, and 
you know, the, the best way to correct for this is just to become more knowledgeable about the world and read more maps, good maps. You've seen these kinds of examples all over the place, so I won't talk too much about it, but the problem is that, you know, sometimes people make very important decisions based on a faulty mental map. And I'm not saying that President Trump has one, but I found this graphic and I thought it helped me to make the point. But if, you, if we're making important decisions based on a flawed or faulty mental or incomplete mental map, then we have to be very, very careful and really use the resources that we have at hand, which are, hopefully, the wonderful maps that you folks make. So the activity of deciphering content on a map is also a function of how mappy the map is, if you will. Some maps are, are more images of the landscape. So a satellite image, or what we call an image map, might be a little easier for some people to decipher in some situations, um, because they might recognize content in that format a little bit easier. But at the other end is a more uh, mappy map, which is something where we've really symbolized the content on the map. We've really changed the representation from what you would see if you looked at a, an airplane into something that has symbology to represent features, and that symbology is very abstracted. So that can impact our ability to read maps as well. And you can actually find cases where it's really easy to read something that's on one side of the continuum, and also very easy to read something on the other side of the continuum. So a very simple map might be very, very simple to read. And an image map, in some cases, and for some people, that might be very simple to read as well. So when we're talking about maps, We've got this very short attention span. We know that we've got to get their attention, we want to draw it in, and then we want them to really learn something from the map. So we want to engage them, and we want to inform them. So we have probably, in, within you know, the first second, the same as the red dot in the blue squares, um, we can get a sense of what the map might look like, a, an overall sense of the balance of the map and the amount of um, content on the map. If it's, if it's a lot of noise or if it's pretty clean and crisp, we can get a sense of that within the first second. Then we start deciphering what that really means. We're resolving those uh, sort of blocked images of this is text and that's an image and that's a title into something that really makes more sense to us. And then finally, we read the content. So I read the title, I read the symbology, I read um, subsections, et cetera. Okay, when we look at a map, we do the very same thing. Not just the page of the map, but the map itself. Is the map content you know, a little harder to read or a little easier to read? I'll tell you one thing, if it looks the same across the whole map, first of all, it's not engaging, and secondly, it's probably not too informative. So it's good to have variation in the density of information on your map. Okay, and then we also resolve finally the information around the map or the surrounds or the, um, the depends on marginalia, whatever terminology you use, so that we can use that ancillary information to understand what's on the map itself. Okay, so that means that map design really does matter. We have to think about how we can inform or communicate with people. And I really came to the realization recently that not all maps are really meant to communicate. They're meant to inform. They're meant for you to pick it up and choose what you want off the map. I may not have a specific message for you. Re reference maps are a good example. Another way that we use maps, though, is to actually share a partic particular message, and thematic maps are an example of that. So I've been hearing an awful lot lately about story maps, and every map has a message, and I just want to remind, you know, remind you that there are some maps that 
really are meant to give you broad information and you get the message that you want off of the map. Okay, maps can be costly both to make and for the resources. Um, so the time and the effort, maybe the training or the you know, technology that's required to make maps um, can be costly. Some maps can be very simple to make. Maps, I think, are hard for many people to understand. And as I mentioned, we wrote the eighth edition of Map Use, came out almost exactly a year ago today. And, you know, it's 600 pages long. That's a lot of content for map use, for learning how to become a truly proficient map user that can ultimately take maps and interpret the world. So you can imagine that not many people are going to read a 600-page textbook on map use. Most people are going to use their own experience in the world to understand how to read maps. And that can be, be really a limiting amount of information for them to um, draw on when, when people are trying to read maps. So I think we have to keep in mind that though we use maps all the time, some people are very um, unused to making decisions, pulling information off of, off of the maps. Maps can provide, provide credibility for you, for your organization, um, and they also must compete with people's attention. And more and more, we're finding this, especially with web maps. So I'm just going to touch on four map design considerations, the intent, the audience, the format, and the strategy. And then I'm going to show you some examples from maps that I've worked on. So the intent. What's your point? Um, does it have a message, or are you trying to give some broad information? What is the focus of the map? And then you can start making design, design decisions based on that. Also, who's your audience? And um, I, I do teach cartography at the university level periodically, and invariably, the students just want to say, the general public. And, and it may be the general public, but I think you need to get a little bit more uh, clear about that. So let me first say, you know, sometimes the point is really simple. Where's the wind going, and how strong is the wind? Let me do that again. This is a very, very simple map. I saw the first iteration of this map about three years ago. I think it was about three years ago. Then I was watching the maps for Hurricane Irma last week, and this symbology was on the map. It's intuitive, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> it's very hard to read that map, Aileen. <laughs> but it's intuitive. I mean, you barely even have to look at the legend, right? And that's Denver. That was this morning at 11.15, around 11.15. Yeah, I'll be happy to show it again. Sure. But they were using this symbology over the colors that showed the intensity of the winds. And this just showed the directions of the winds, right? So uh, back to the audience, though. You probably can assume, make a very safe assumption, that whoever's reading your map knows less about the topic than you do. Even if you're asked by somebody else to make a map, the process of making the map informs you about the location, the, the content that you're mapping, so maybe the theme. You become informed in the process. And I was saying last night while we were playing the um, trivia game that, you know, cartographers and geographers and you folks who work with GIS, we're no different than anybody else. The more, the more we're familiar with a place, we've lived there, we've traveled to it, the more we're going to know about it. So, yeah, I didn't know about that strait in Istanbul. But, <laughs> you know, being a cartographer, being a geographer, that one of the first things I did was go and look it up when, I, when we could because we were told not to look things up. <laughs> so, but I did, and it's, it's very interesting. So, um, yeah, your readers will know less about the topic than you do, most likely. Um, your readers will have a wide range of experience, expertise, 
interest and, and world knowledge. So when they're trying to fit that information that they're getting off of the map into their mental map, the ability for them to do that is going to vary widely within your audience, depending on your audience. Let's say you're working with a group of people that you always work with, and the content that you're showing on the map is content that they always work with off of maps. The ability for them to, st to plug it into their worldview is going to be very high. You know? But if you're working with the general public, then you have to imagine a wide range of abilities. All map readers, all map readers appreciate simplicity and clarity. And even the technical audiences really do appreciate this. Most map readers are willing to learn, some maybe aren't, but all map readers are almost generally pretty busy too. It's, it's the rare occasion that you can become the armchair traveler with the map in front of you and just peruse the map for a while. It's a wonderful thing to do, I love to do it myself, but it's, it's not part of my job. It's not part of my normal everyday experience, but um, every so often we get to do that, but that's not the norm. And also people are easily distracted. There's a lot of stuff going on around us, especially in like um, a digital environment because you know your email pops up and then you get a message and then you hear you know a, a sound because something happened, somebody left you you know a message on, on your message board or something like that. So there's a lot of stuff going on in a digital environment. And you know it's even worse if you get on some people's websites and they have all those ads that are flashing and you know. So we're really competing for people's attention. Um, but even on paper maps, even for paper maps. And I think you can also assume that your readers are intelligent, but as I mentioned, maybe not very skilled in map use itself. Okay, so where will your maps be seen? How will they be used? Is it gonna be from a distance, up close, on a computer screen, um, in the field? So this map, for example, by Tom Patterson of the National Park Service of the Grand Canyon, um, first of all, has a format that he has to adhere to. The black ribbon with the title and then the black ribbon at the other end. That's a standard format for National Park Service maps. So, okay, I have to deal with that, right, in my design. Then, maybe this map is gonna be folded up, right? Generally, if you go to a national park, you get the folded up version when you come in the door. So that's you know, gonna get crinkled and wrinkled and maybe stuck in the back pocket while somebody's hiking. So is that gonna impact the use of the map? Possibly. But then other maps are meant you know, to be seen in a different way. And some maps can only be seen in a particular way. To see this swipe, um, you know, I should just loop them, but that's okay. To see this swipe map, the only way to really see it is to work with it, swipe it and move it. So this is um, before and after Hurricane Irma. Okay, finally strategy. How do you want your map to be received? Do you want it to be authoritative and they just sort of peruse it for a while? Do you want them to look at it and say, oh, wow, I never knew? Or do you want them to um, you know, be persuaded to take some action? What's your intent for their reaction? So I say it's a demo, but I'm really, now I'm gonna show you some examples because these are maps that I've worked on and um, Give credit where credit is due. This is a map that Stuart Allen came up with the primary design for and I executed for him. We worked together in tandem. He was in Oregon, I was in Southern California. I'd send him screenshots. He'd send me back information about changes color, change at font, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea is that we're making a metro atlas, an atlas of the United States metropolitan areas. So the intent is to show the detail of the metropolitan areas, and we want to show some themes, three themes, um, per capita income, uh, race and ethnicity, and population density for every metropolitan area in the United States. And while it was originally intended to be a print atlas, we have now shuffled it over to be something that we would probably look at online. And then it could be updated with information um, on a more regular basis. Okay, so again, the, 
the view is not optimized for PowerPoint. So let me explain a little bit about this. This is Denver. Um, there is very limited base information on here. We have freeways. We have airports. We will, but right now don't because it's a problem database, have colleges and universities. We have hydro hydrographic features and we have some point features to identify cities and some labels. And that's pretty much it. Now, why did we even include um, airports and colleges and universities? Oh, and military areas. Because they truly impact the demographic data in those areas. There is going to be low popu or no population density, so there's not going to be any race or ethnicity to report. And there's not going to be any per capita income to report. So you really need to have those influencing factors in the base map. But other than that, aside from a few administrative boundaries, what I told you already is what, what is on the map. But the first thing we did was create a map of the built up area. So on this map, we used na national land cover data set data for two themes. One is land cover. And all we pulled out from it was forest and agriculture, hay and pasture, fields like that. And then the other thing was the uh, amount of impervious surface. Because remember, we're trying to map the metropolitan areas. So sometimes, as in the case of Denver, the areas that are nearby come straight up to the city boundaries. And of course, um, to the east of Denver, it's pasture, not, not really woodland, right? Um, but there's woodland to the west of Denver. So those are important things because then you can see, oh, it's a transition zone. Um, the other thing about n the National Land Cover data set was it was a great thing to find out where the urban footprint was. I mean, yeah, there is urban space out there that's not impervious surface, right? Parks and things like that. We can get some of that um, off the National Land Cover data set if we have the forests in there, you know, and there's tree cover in those areas. But the, the urban footprint can be resolved from the National Land Cover impervious surface data set. But the trick is you have to find the cutoff point. We stopped, we, we used just gray tones here, black to white, but where do you put white? So I think we cut it off at 15% is what we used in the national land, in the in percent of impervious surface. But depending on the, and we were doing the entire United States too. So the urban footprint for Denver, the way that you want, might want to look at it, might have a different cutoff for the amount of impervious surface. Maybe you want to include more area or exclude more. Okay, the reason I'm harping on a little bit about the NLCD data, especially for impervious surfaces, I'm going to show you what we used it for, not just this map. So this was one of the maps we made for each urban area, the built up area. Then we wanted to do per capita income. Well, what happens when you use choropleth mapping for non-urban areas? What happens to the polygon size? It becomes huge. And what happens to the visual draw of the eye? It goes to the areas that are not in urban area because that's where all the ink is or the color. So what could we do? Well, we thought, we could filter maybe by where the population density is lower. So we pulled out um, any area that had really low population densities. Again, it's an urban atlas. So we just made those areas white. All right, well, what happens if we apply that to, oh wait, I don't wanna go there. Let's apply that to per capita income. All right, so now we're getting rid of some of that external information that's not really the urban area, but there's still some out there. So what did we do? We blocked it, masked it with the impervious surface mask. Now I see what's going on in the urban area. And I can tell that there are these pockets of really high per capita income, pockets of lower per capita income. Does that look like a pretty good representation of Denver to you if you're from the Denver area? Yeah? Okay. 
All right, so this is the approach we used, and it's the classic choropleptic mapping problem is that you get lots of ink or lots of color in places where you rarely want it because most of the time we're interested in where people are. Another, I don't have an example of it in here, but another approach that Stuart has used is to place um, just a point, a, a circle symbol in the areas with larger um, areas with no people you know, larger census tracts with no people, and use a point symbol symbology combined with a choropleptic mapping inside the more densely populated areas. Works okay, actually, surprisingly. Now let's look at race and ethnicity. Um, I have to say, there's not a lot of variation in Denver. <laughs> so just bear with me. It's a lot more interesting by LA. <laughs> Okay, same problem again, lots of, lots of color outside the urban area, so we take out those population density tracts, census tracts, that have too low of a population threshold, and then we mask out the rest. So, pretty much white here. Little bit of black, and I don't really see any Asian. No Hawaiian Pacific <laughs> dominance. <laughs> okay, so does that make sense to you, the way we approach this, this problem? Okay, um, I also want to point out that the same base map we used for the built-up area was just only slightly altered for all the rest of the maps. And for the three thematic maps, it was not altered at all. The same base map was used for all of them. So you can tell that there is very little information on here. Remember, simplicity and clarity. There's Few roads, um, the areas that are military or that are um, airports are filled polygons. That takes the line off the edge of the polygon. That reduces simplicity even more. Um, we did put lines around the hydrographic features because, for example, on our race, race and ethnicity maps, we have patches of blue. They aren't the same blue if you see them on my screen but um, just to help clarify a little bit more for, for people and also um, to find smaller features. But there's a cutoff on the size of feature that we used on the map. So we filtered heavily on all of this. What we did include, though, is, as far as we could, every census tract boundary. Important on census maps. I find more and more maps these days that are census data that don't show the area boundaries, and I think that's, that can be misleading for people because they think that they're bigger areas, and they're not. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now and talk about a different map altogether. Has anybody ever seen my Crater Lake version of the map? Yeah. Well, I'm hopefully going to show you a couple new things, too. But maybe you've seen it all. I'm not sure. Okay, this is what we start with. Kind of ugly. No labels on there at all, even. This is just, this is a data dump. And this is what we want to get away from. So this is where we're going to end up. And it's not really that hard. So I'm going to start, uh, now I'm zoomed in, because I want to show you some detail. I'm going to start with the, the base of a lot of maps, which is the terrain. And this is the default hillshade that you get from ArcGIS um, if you just run the hillshade tool. So. You can imagine that putting a lot of information on this kind of a base is going to be very difficult because it's very complex. I want to point out that we have a new thing out there. It is called the multi-directional hillshade. You can use this as an image service in your maps. It's multi-scale, so you can zoom in and out. You can use it on your web maps. You don't have to render at all. You can just use it on your maps. But there is a raster function that you can apply to your own data very quickly and very easily. It's on our GitHub repo for raster functions, and it will create this multi-directional terrain representation. I think, personally, it's gorgeous. And it creates a nice base for information because it allows me some breathing room to put other content on top of it. Mm. So the next thing we want to do is create um, some representation of elevation using a, a layer tint or hypsometric, hypsometric shading. 
I don't know why. I can say this in front of you because I have said it many, many, many times in front of my colleagues at Esri. We only have two elevation hill shades in there, elevation one and two. Please try not to use them. We have, <laughs> we have a set of color ramps that we created for you to download and apply, and they are applicable. There are so many in there. They're applicable all over the world. So if you're trying to choose color ramps, do yourself a favor and look in color ramps 3.0. You can just do ArcGIS style color ramps 3.0. And I think it actually, there was a, I think it's in a blog entry I wrote. Okay, so now we've got kind of a base to work on. But I have bathymetry as well. So I can't just put a big blue polygon on there, or I have a green one on there right now, because I have so much detail on my terrain. So I'm going to use the bathymetry. In this case, I created a hillshade using a median filter on the DEM, again, to just get rid of some of the detail. And then I used a um, color ramp that was grays, not black to white, but gray to darker gray to lighter gray. And if you add a tiny bit of red in there, it just softens it up and makes it look a little bit more terrainish. And then we put the bathymetry um, layer tint on top. And Crater Lake is such a wonderful lake to work with because it's got that beautiful blue hue. I also have a color ramp that has uh, greens around the very, very edge because if you go to Crater Lake, it actually has algae around the edges. So you can get it to be as um, you know complex as you want it to be, but I pulled it out of this one because it was a little too complex for this one. I also have um, National Land Cover data set of the trees in the park. and. So I use that to create a little bit of texture. Can you see the texture? It's called texture mapping. It's used very, very often. If you're using Illustrator instead of something like ArcGIS, then you can just take that layer and put a little texture on it. It'll work just as well. But we did this create, we created this using some tools that we developed called bump map tools. And you can search for bump map tools and you'll find those as well. You can download them and use them yourself. And actually, you can configure the tools to use perimeter sizes of your tree crowns and um, height of trees as well, because it's actually simulating like a bump. And then it can simulate um, conifer trees and deciduous trees and even rocks, which are squares. So it's pretty cool. OK, then I wanted, that was a subtle change. I just wanted to de-emphasize the area around the park. Um, I really like it when you can give a little bit of background information to your reader outside of your study area. So this is one trick. We call it whitewashing. Might be another name for it, I'm not sure. But we call it whitewashing. Um, another trick is to sort of feather out, sort of do a gradient feather out to an area outside the map. So say I could put a gradient out to about here, give them a little information around the edge of the, the map, but it's not just a polygon sitting in space all by itself. So there are some easy tricks for that too. Um, blog entries on that as well give you all the in instructions step by step. OK, then I added a park boundary. Very subtle. I'm going to go back again. See these areas where there's uh, not much distinction? I wanted to put just enough that you could tell there was a difference there. And I mean subtle. This is like at 70% transparency. Again, simplicity, clarity. Bump everything back from the way that you think you want it, and you might be happy with the results. So just a very light. Um, representation here. This double band is, is created using representations in ArcGIS. Um, and now, I'm sorry, but when I made the rest of these screenshots, I took my boundary back out. So imagine my boundary in there. Okay. Hydro's next. So we really, I really filtered out the streams and the, and the uh, polygon features. And I put in um, point features like springs. I have some bogs. I have rivers and streams, and um, little tiny lakes. And I included this 
lake polygon here because if I looked at my bathymetry and my um, DEM together, there was ever so slight little bit of pixelation around there. So this just masked that up. I want to point out, again, sometimes I mentioned sometimes things are very small and subtle. The proper way to map springs is for the tail end to go where the water's flowing to. Don't think of them as a tadpole flowing downstream. It's the exact opposite. So I got in and I just rotated my spring features using, um, I created an attribute in the attribute table for those point features and I gave an angle of rotation and I just rotated them. Okay, next thing, trails and roads. Uh, scaled back way, way a lot on the roads. This is um, fashioned after a map that Tom Patterson, who we saw his Grand Canyon map, had made for Crater Lake. Um, really, if it's, a, if it's a tourist map, then it's really all you need to give them is the roads that the tourists are gonna be using, right? Um, okay, so, and we have some trails too. I wanna show you something, again, a very subtle little um, trick, but this casing should not be overlapping here. So you just remove that kind of little detail and the clarity is much better for your user because this almost looks to me like an overpass. So giving them as much clarity as possible. Now you can see that I put in some physiographic feature, la or sorry, these are point features for summits. Again, I pulled out lots and lots of features, just some primary ones. I want to show you how those were labeled. Just have the name of the peak, uh, the elevation in both feet and meters. Very simple. Then we put in the cultural feature polygon, or the cultural feature points. You know, where's an overlook? Where's a picnic site? Where's a camping ground? And I want you to take a look at these purple polygons. These are physiographic features. You can do the same thing with marine water bodies. And we actually provide two data sets for you. I think you can get them through the Living Atlas of physiographic features and marine water bodies. Because if you don't label these features, your map will look unfinished. Especially in areas where there's a lot of physiographic um, variation. Or if you're working in areas along, along um, water bodies. So, the Pacific Northwest would look ridiculous if we didn't have water body labels in there. These polygons are not symbolized on the map. They're only used for labeling, which is then the last step. And um, so now these, all these little features are labeled. And I want to, I want to share with you something that Tom Patterson said at the International Cartographic Conference just at the beginning of July this year. He said, you know, labels on the map are like the pheromones of a map. They can draw you in, or, or they can repulse you. But they're the thing that makes you identify content on the map. Oh, that's um, Pumice Flat, or oh, that's Watchman Peak. So you can, again, begin to build that world view. So labors, labels are super duper important. Okay, then you put in some other stuff. You know, here's very simple North Arrow, very simple um, scale bar, very simple legend. And one thing I want to, a couple things I want to point out about the legend. I don't need to say legend, it's obvious, right? I also don't need to put on there anything that's obvious on the map. Hydrographic features with a blue fill and a blue outline are so prevalent on maps that I don't need to put them on here. The Roads on this map are all labeled, and the trails are labeled as well. So because they're labeled on the map, I don't need them in the legend. And even if, not, even if all the features are not labeled on the map, I have some trails, for example, the black dash line, that are labeled, and I have some that aren't. But if you look on the map and you're reading that you know, so-and-so trail right next to the feature symbology, then you can decipher the rest of the map. Try to keep your legends um, as simple as possible. And there's the final map. I'm just going to take a minute and talk about a couple minutes, because I have a couple minutes, uh, another variation on Crater Lake. And I was really super excited to see that one of the posters, it was a student poster, had a representation of aspect on it. Is that student? 
who made that map in the room? I'm going to show you what he or she did. Um, and then I'm going to show you what I did. OK, so this is the final map. And I want to show you a little bit about how I got there. If you just use the default symbology for um, aspect from ArcGIS, this is what you'll get. And it's not too bad, but there is a better way to do it um, because um, we can actually make the aspect map look like it has relief like it has shaded relief without adding shaded relief to the map. So let's see how we do that. Oh, and this is what the student did. Um, variations of green, which I thought was pretty clever and actually brought some things out that I might have missed otherwise. But let's see what I, I worked on. The other thing we can do with aspect is we can combine it with slope. This map of aspect from the student is actually also giving you an idea of, of slope. So this is a slope map. We're going to combine the aspect and the slope into one map and come up with something like this. Now, these are very similar colors to what was on the original um, aspect map. If I, if I were to look at this feature here, for example. But we also get the impression now of terrain, don't we? Because we've segmented aspect into steep slopes, well, we've combined aspect with steep slopes, medium slopes, and low slopes, and one class for flat slopes. So if we look at that, this is, this is what it looks like. These are the original colors. We can So that's all fine and well. That actually works pretty well. But there is some alteration that you can do to the colors when you're looking at them on a computer screen. So um, Cindy Brewer came up with the original two sets of colors. And she used, um, she used a, uh, an instrument that measures the luminosity from a computer screen to modify the original colors so that they are optimized for computer screen viewing. So that's the variation that we see in these two colors. And that's the final map. And that, to me, is pretty decipherable. This is based on a MKT coloring scheme, which, for aspect, has lighter areas coming from the northwest, darker areas in the southeast, so that's almost like a hillshade, light coming from the northwest, shadow from the southeast. And you can sort of see this looks almost like a little cone, if you will, and on this map as well here. OK, so then on this map, we had to add a couple surrounds as well. We need to give the legend. And then we, I just altered the text, give it a little bit of variation so it's a little more interesting to look at. And then that's the map. So you can see, sometimes <clears throat> what we do is bigger, and sometimes it's smaller. Sometimes little things have an effect. Sometimes big things have an effect. Oops. I have this little piece of text on here, and that wasn't supposed to be there. But yeah, we can say that maps have always told stories. And, and really, that hasn't changed in the digital realm. Most of the rules still apply. Um, you could see that there was some variation in colors. There would be variation in text. You would make it a little hot, um, larger because there's less resolution on the screens. You can't always um, depend on retinal displays. Um, but there's now a little bit of difference in the tools and the techniques because people really want to understand more from maps, I think, when they're able to interact with them. So giving them pop-ups or giving them tools like the swipe tool really helps them. Um, also, we are being inundated with geographic information, and people want to make sense of it. They need to make sense of it. So our audiences are growing. There, and there are some of them are new audiences for us. Maybe they're outside of the general range of our normal map readers. 
because when we put our information out there in a map form, on the, dig on the web anyway, anybody can access it unless you set permissions and things. There's greater accessibility because of um, new media formats. There are new languages. Um, there are new platforms that we can look at things in, and that gives us new ways of presenting information. So yeah, it can take a little while to learn some of that stuff. Part of my job is to help you get up and running as quickly as possible, so I try and publish and share best practices and tools and shade, you know, styles and all that stuff with you guys so you can you know, get up to speed pretty quickly. But sometimes it does take a little while. But the big difference in the digital age is the wrapper, the app that's around the web map that provides that more directed user experience and really if it is sort of a story situation that you're working with on your map, can lead them right through from point A to point B to point C so they come to the conclusion that you want them to come to. So we have a lot more capabilities, a lot more opportunities today. Okay. We really should think, though, as we're designing the map, of what the user experience will be and how we're going to design that user experience. Even the colors on the maps to the colors in the you know, in the app or um, the, the way that you design the map so that people can use it the way you want, that you want them to interactively. So then that brings me to the end of my talk and how do I end it? Well, I don't. I think you do. You're the ones that I think are going to go out and make those maps that engage, inform, and inspire people. And I hope what I was able to do today is give you a few little tips and tricks. <laughs> there goes my video again. Um, for ways that you can do that. So I'll just stop there and thank you very much for your attention. I think I, I, think I speak on behalf of all of us that uh, that presentation, we are all engaged, informed, and inspired <laughs> of that. And we really appreciate you coming to speak with us today. And because of that, we have a small token of our appreciation to present to you. Uh, Christy. Oh, thank you. That's really sweet. And let me get a photo. <laughs> <laughs> to put them off everything here. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get a picture of everything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is, is Peter Batty with us as well today? He didn't know if he could make it back today, but uh, we've got him something as well, so we'll get that to him. A few announcements before we take our final break of the conference. CDA is starting right now at 2, so if you're involved with the CDA, uh, the Career Development Academy, it's in the Conifer Evergreen Rooms uh, right down the hall. Uh, also, there are tours available still for sign up tomorrow. I know the Stranahan's Whiskey Tour. If you didn't get that bottle of whiskey from PLSC, just go taste some tomorrow. Uh, there's some for that, and I think uh, the uh, Botanical Gardens and the Celestial Seasons Tour are still available. Um, other than that, um, we're going to take our final break. Uh, we're going to reconvene at 2.30. We're going to convert these back to four rooms. And uh, we're going to have another hour of sessions. So please stay with us to the end. And please, the exhibitors that are still here, please visit them if you need to. Thank you. All points, all points raffle right now.